Section number 16 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Dane Smitley. The Empire of Business, Section number 16 The Land. The land features prominently in political and social questions only in the British Islands. It has settled itself in all other regions occupied by the English-speaking race. It is not a burning question in America, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand, nor in most European countries where the land is mainly divided in small portions among the people. In the United States, in 1900, there were 5,739,657 farms and 10,381,765 adults engaged in agricultural pursuits. The farms averaged 146 acres. The rapid increase of these may be seen from the fact that in 1850 there were only one and a half million, in 1880 only four million farms. So the good work has gone on, an average increase of 85,000 additional farms per year for the past 50 years, and the end is not yet. As a rule, farms are cultivated by the owners. If happy homes be the crown of civilization, we have here the scripture fulfilled. Millions of men sit under their own vine and fig tree, with none to make afraid. Land is free for sale or purchase, and is lightly taxed where it is taxed at all. The world may be ransacked in vain for equally large numbers of men, women, and children residing under such favorable conditions. Home sweet home is the spot round which center their fondest hopes, their dearest wishes, and their greatest happiness. The few who rent for the time have the desire and reasonable hope of soon owning their homes, the wisest purchase that can be made. Similar conditions prevail in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. France has five and a half million peasant proprietors. Germany has over six million, average holding 30 acres. It is only in the United Kingdom that the land question is acute. The present conditions of land holding in the countries named prove to the people of the old land what can be done. But the favored people of the four new countries named had a clean slate to begin with, nothing to obliterate. They do not, therefore, teach the needed lesson to the motherland which Denmark does. That wonderful little country, not long ago, was in the hands of a few owners, who rented it in portions to farmers, whose position was that of farmers in the United Kingdom today. But it is now very different. They are now on the same plane as farm owners in America and other English-speaking nations. The land that seventy-odd years ago was in the hands of the few is now owned by no less than 86,000 people, and, as to 75,000 of the holdings, the law prevents their being merged to form larger farms or estates. The area of the country is less than 10 million acres, and the population two and a half millions. Denmark's exports of butter, eggs, cheese, bacon, beef, and pork to Great Britain alone in 1904 amounted to more than 15 million sterling. A startling statement. One wonders what British farmers are doing. No revolution was necessary to produce the change, no government ownership. It was all quietly done, one step after another. The country was divided into farms of a certain size, and a progressive land tax levied. For one man cultivating one farm, the tax was small. If he had another, the tax was much greater upon the second, and so on, until additions became prohibitive, the object being to favor the owning of farms by those who cultivated them. The produce of the land is now three times as great as under the former system of large proprietors, still existing in the United Kingdom. The magic said to be in ownership was really found there. By following the example of Denmark, which involves neither dangerous experiment nor violent disturbance, the land of the United Kingdom can be owned and worked by the owners thereof, each man with a reasonable acreage, and thus many happy and endearing homes established. This is well, but it is not all, or even the best, result. Denmark's policy has created an independent, prosperous, happy, and contented people. Instead of one great mammoth landowner, the state, as socialists propose, Britain should have hundreds of thousands of small owners, necessarily developing into men of a much higher type than mere tenants or employees can ever become. The magic of ownership works wonders, not only upon the soil, but upon the happy working owner thereof. The type of men developed in America upon farms they own, taken all in all, is not to be equaled, as far as the writer has known large classes of men. The same qualities characterize the land-owning workers of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Denmark. Land in these countries is everywhere free, as other property is. The laws of primogeniture and settlements exist only in Britain. 
No English-speaking people elsewhere would tolerate them. We have a striking instance of land development going forward in America at present. Forty-odd years ago, there were four million slaves owned by other people. They owned nothing, and could own nothing. They could not even own themselves. They had neither rights nor responsibilities. They were bought and sold. In 1900, under present conditions, these former slaves owned, as landlords, 173,352 farms. They leased and cultivated, as farmers, 762,000 farms. They have church property valued at more than $25 million. Great additions have been made to their lands since 1900. Here we have a race who, in 1862, could own nothing, not even themselves, now owning and cultivating the soil in small portions, no rent to pay. They could neither read nor write, and now the percentage of illiteracy has fallen from 83.5 in 1870 to 47.4 in 1900. When such progress can be made under free trade in land, surely we should be careful about revolutionizing conditions which produce such precious fruit. The extent of land owned and cultivated by these people in small areas furnishes the greatest contrasts to that of the United Kingdom, that between small landlords cultivating their own land and men who pay a rental to territorial magnates whose lands they cultivate. The more than 11 millions of working people and their children settled upon the land in America as agriculturalists are the backbone of the republic, intelligent, fair, kindly, sober, and law-abiding. One who knows them would hesitate long to disturb conditions which gave the state such model citizens. To transfer the land now cultivated and mainly owned by these people into the hands of the state and degrade the present working owners into menials working for and paid by state agents is unthinkable. Our socialistic friends would require larger armies to coerce them than have ever yet assembled, and they would fail. For men fighting in defense of their homes, in which many of them and most of their children were born, would have their quarrel just. No offer on the part of the state to ensure their continued residence undisturbed would be entertained. They would never agree to come under any restriction of their right to do as they pleased with their own homes. It is the same with Canadians and Australasians. In every English-speaking land other than Britain, estates are generally divided about equally among the children, but the farm usually goes to the member most qualified to work it the other members taking other parts of the estate or mortgages upon the farm. The proposed exclusive taxation of land, proposed by Henry George, was denounced by the people of Canada and America as keenly as would be a proposition to make America a monarchy or Canada a colony minus self-government. In both lands the agriculturalists rule that the most eloquent socialists endeavor to convince these owners of the soil, true landlord farmers, that they are not part and the best part of the most highly developed and most desirable society known to man, and he will have a rude awakening. No socialism for them. Much is to be said against the British landlord system. It has little to commend it. It is a survival of the past, but let not socialists imagine that the recourse to state ownership is the proper substitute. Let them follow the example of Denmark, and, by the creation of farmer landlords, each with one farm, give to Britain one of the greatest blessings, a land-owning and land-tilling people instead of a few land-owning squires who neither toil nor spin. Here lies before Britain a task easy of accomplishment. It is no experiment, neither is it revolutionary. Our own race in other lands and the people of Denmark have proved the value of small farms owned and cultivated by owners. One reads with wonder that the cultivated land of the United Kingdom, including parks and permanent pastures, but not mountain or waste, amounted in 1880 to 47,515,747 acres. The total acreage is 77,635,301 acres. By the Doomsday Book of 1875, it appeared that one-fourth of the total acreage, excluding plots under one acre, is held by 1,200 owners, at an average for each of 16,200 acres another fourth by 6,200 persons, at an average of 3,150 acres. Another fourth is held by 50,770 persons, averaging 380 acres each, and the remaining fourth by 261,830 persons, averaging 70 acres each. Peers, in number about 600, hold rather more than one-fifth of all the land in the kingdom. Thus, one-half of the whole country 
is in the hands of only 7,400 individuals. The other half is divided among 312,500 individuals. In Scotland, the contrast is even greater. Twelve persons in 1876 held more than a quarter of Scotland. Seventy held half. Nine-tenths of Scotland was held by fewer than 1,700 persons. As upon the vital question of equal or unequal wages the socialists are divided, they are also upon the equally important question of the confiscation of, or payment for, the land, which, according to their theory, the nations should acquire. Mr. Sidney Webb testified before the Royal Commission on Labor in 1892. Question. Supposing it, the rate, had to go so far as to amount to twenty shillings on the pound, what then? Answer. That is a consummation I should view without any alarm whatsoever. Question. The municipality would then have rated the owners out of existence, would it not? Answer. That is so. The president of the Scottish Land Restoration Union testified before the Royal Commission on Local Taxation, April 14, 1898. Question. What is to be the next step? Answer. Increase the tax upon the value of the ground. Question. Until you take it all? Answer. Until you take twenty shillings in the pound. Bailey Ferguson, before the same Royal Commission, testified, I hold that nothing short of twenty shillings in the pound will be a complete settlement of the question. Mr. Joseph Hyder, in The Crux of the Land Question, page 16, says, Every land nationalizer should assist this taxation reform in order to facilitate the state acquisition of the land upon the most favorable terms possible. Mr. Blatchford, in Merry England, page 60, says, now, if a man has a right to nothing but that which he himself has made, no man can have a right to the land, for no man made it. My only hope is that compensation be kept as low as possible. Mr. Jowett, MP, says that Socialists recognize the expediency in all, and the justice, in some cases, of paying for land rather than confiscating it. The truth is that the socialistic leaders have not hesitated to propose the most sweeping changes, amounting to a revolution of existing conditions, without having first considered how these were to be accomplished. They differ upon equal and unequal wages, a fundamental question, and upon payment for or confiscation of the land, purchase or robbery, another fundamental question. These two questions determine what socialism is or is not. They are the pillars of the socialistic edifice, and not yet agreed upon. Upon one point, however, there is unanimity. The land must, in one way or another, be nationalized. All agree to this. Lord Wolverhampton has recently flashed light upon this subject of payment for or confiscation of the land by telling a story of Gladstone. The world's foremost citizen, being asked about socialism, replied that it had to meet this query. Did it propose to buy the land or take it? If the first, it was folly. If the second, it was robbery. Let us assume, for the present, that the demand for confiscation made by the radical section of the Socialist Party will be rejected by the moderates. The query then arises, how is the land to be paid for? The great bulk of it has been acquired under law as it then existed, and as it exists today. Territory won by force in bygone ages as a whole is now in the possession of innocent purchasers. It has been paid for. Now, if there be one tenant of honest dealing firmly rooted in the conscience of civilized men, it is that the title to such purchase is valid. The possessor must be paid a fair price for what the law has declared to be his. He can be robbed of his property, of course, but an advance toward heaven upon earth, founded upon robbery, would infallibly be a step in the other direction. Backwards, not forwards. Downward, not upward. Civilized man has advanced already under present conditions beyond the idea of robbery. Its advocacy would shock him, and the entire socialistic movement would be discarded as not only visionary, but confiscatory. A proposal to rob the neighbor. If it be clear that the property must be bought, it is equally clear that honesty compels the state to pay a fair value for it. As the state alone could be the purchaser, it must deal fairly in forcing compulsory acquisition. To whom will payment go? To whom can it go? Except the owners of the property taken. Ah, there's the rub. What becomes of the socialist state in that event? Where is the equality upon which the state is to be founded? Impossible, because the rich and the poor we would still have with us, and the present division into classes be revived. For it is wealth, not birth, in our day which creates class distinctions. 
The claims of birth in our race only survive in the United Kingdom. They would be laughed at elsewhere if presented. It is not only the land that the state has to purchase. The mills and furnaces, the shipyards, the railways, all means of production and distribution must also be acquired and paid for. To say that all productive property could be rented and paid for out of the profits does not affect the question. The rents would go to the owners, and they would remain rich. What just power could compel them to leave their present homes and modes of life, surrender their rents to the state, and become socialists? The payment made for their property would become a mockery if they were not allowed to spend what was their own. Yet unless the payment made to the owners with one hand be promptly taken away by the other, no socialism would be possible, for it must be based not upon the capital of the few, but upon wealth in common, owned not by the individual, but by the state. Besides this, as before quoted in the case of unequal wages, the ideal to be aimed at ultimately must be approximate equality of income. Otherwise, class formations must take place, and the old problems incidental to economic inequality reappear. Should the socialist be driven from the idea of taking the land from private owners without paying for it, how is payment to be made? The cash could not be raised. Evidently, there is but one mode. The state must issue consuls. Sixteen or more hundred million sterling for land and farm improvements, for mines, machinery, etc., say half as much more, or altogether three times the amount of the national debt. What price could consuls, already much below par, reach under such an issue? Let the enthusiastic socialist ask the banker and learn what would ensue. What receiver of consuls would feel safe, holding the bond of a government that forced compulsory sale and snatched from him his home, the dearest spot on earth to him and his? Who would wish to live under such a government or in such a land? Few indeed of those most desirable to retain. Canada and America would be too attractive, and the despoiled would follow the pilgrims, their forefathers, who left their old home and settled in the new, where men had rights and liberties then denied at home, and private property was inviolate. After settling the land problem through purchase with freedom to spend proceeds as former owners desire, or through confiscation under compulsion of uniformity of living, there is another step, as mentioned, which socialism must overleap or else fall down. Until officials, superintendents, foremen, and skilled mechanics are willing to accept the recompense earned by the sweepers of the factories, there can be no success for socialism, for upon this foundation it is compelled to stand. The moment equality of payment is dropped, and a commission is formed to found and enforce inequality of payment, the phantom vanishes. We are back again to our present system with all its inequalities. Unequal income means unequal outgo, hence inequalities or, as we individualists would put it, healthful variety needed for the improvement of man in his march upward toward perfection. The cry of the socialist of today in Britain should not be against private ownership of land, but against there being so few private owners. To distribute the land by abolishing primogeniture and settlements and through progressive taxation is surely the next practical step. Being so palpably the remedy for the present unsatisfactory condition of the problem, it would seem that the needed legislation could not be long denied. When the interests of the masses of the people require change in land tenure, the few owners can justly be required to forego their preferences or submit to increased taxation if they decide to enjoy privileges injurious to the community as a whole. In all other English-speaking countries, the people work the land. In Britain, the landlords work the people. The writer cannot but believe that if, once the United Kingdom had its people settled upon the land as owners and cultivators, as other parts of the empire and America have, its nationalization would never be thought of. End of section 13. The Land.